So hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, um, How to Effectively Advocate um, in the United States for the Universal Periodic Review. I'm Yolan Tomlinson, the National Education Coordinator with the U.S. Human Rights Network. Um, and this call is hosted by the USHR and UPR Task Force. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the, the network, might just be joining us for the first time, the network is a national network of organizations and individuals who are working to build and strengthen a people-centered human rights movement and culture in the United States. Um, and we work by centering the experiences of those who are directly impacted by human rights violations. Um, we have a wonderful list of speakers um, who will be um, you know, giving us important information about how to advocate effectively um, as part of this UPR process. Um, first, on the left-hand corner, upper left-hand corner, is Mary Garrett. Mary is uh, one of our dedicated uh, co-chairs of the UPR task force and also a member, an actively engaged member of the Vermont Workers' Center. Um, then we have Joshua Cooper. Uh, Joshua Cooper is also um, a co-chair with the ICCPR task force, um, and Josh is also the director of the Four Freedoms Foundation, uh, forums rather. Um, on the right of Josh, we have Tenjiwe uh, McHarris. Tenjiwe is the director of the Human Rights at Home campaign uh, with the U.S. Human Rights Network. And I am in the left-hand corner um, in the black and white photograph. I usually leave myself out, but I figured to add balance, I would include it today. Um, and in the center, we have Amy Berquist. Amy is a member of the UPR task force and the staff attorney at the Advocates for Human Rights in Minnesota. And finally, we have Rebecca Landy, uh, my colleague, who is the <clears throat> Human Rights Outreach Coordinator with the U.S. Human Rights Network. So our agenda for the call in includes the following. Um, a, a set of a presentation to lay out the broad uh, UPR advocacy strategy, and that includes talking um, differently than we have before about what the UPR is by comparing it to the treaty review process, which many of you, um, I'm sure, are familiar with. Um, Another important piece of the strategy is talking about some of the upcoming diplomacy dialogues and country consultations, and that will be covered by um, Joshua Cooper, uh, and Mary will cover the UPR and how it compares to the treaty review process. Um, and finally, as part of the strategy, we'll talk about and, and go in more depth on what it is, what's involved in submitting the one-pager. Um, if Mary last time went over how you create that one-pager, um, Amy will cover how do you actually go through the UPR info database, locate the country, um, figure out which of the, the countries to send your reports to and how to find their contact information. Um, an important opportunity for engaging in the U.S. will happen on February 20th um, in a consultation in D.C., and that will be covered by my colleague, Kenji Uwe McCarris, um, and some of the important um, strategies for maximizing your time there will also be covered. Um, and then finally, we will talk about our plans for advocating in Geneva, talking about um, the delegation that will be there in March, as well as the in-person um, dialogue with the U.S. government in May. And finally, we'll open up for questions from you, uh, and Rebecca will be moderating that section. So, uh, Mary, um, can you tell us a bit more about the, the Universal Periodic Review, specifically talking about how it compares to the treaty review processes and what folks can, um, so how they can expect to advocate as part of this process? Yes, thank you very much, Yolan. Um, so what I'd like to do, and I realize this is in part a, a review for those of you who were on our last webinar, but I think we're going to also take a different approach so that anyone who is new to the process can understand the advocacy that goes on. And you'll see on the next slide, we are going to be talking about whether or not it's the same as a treaty review, the universal periodic review. And it's not. <laughs> and a treaty, um, you'll see the, I use the ICCPR treaty because that's one that I'm very familiar with. And the Universal Periodic Review is much more all-encompassing. And so I'd like to start out uh, on the next slide talking about what is the difference. 
So I'm using as an example the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the ICCPR. And the, one of the differences is that these covenants, like the ICCPR, CAT, CERD, they are actual treaties that have been signed and some have also been ratified, which means that not only has our government signed as a party, but that our um, Senate and our representatives have actually ratified them. And the result of that is that the treaty is actually considered to be the highest law of the land. And so it is, in fact, federally sanctioned and federally approved by representatives from all the states as well as by the federal government officials themselves. And the treaties have specific articles that outline certain obligations. For example, um, there may be an article in the ICCPR that talks about workers' rights relative to immigrants, and it gives some very specific guidelines on what has to happen. It may talk about specific rights that fall under those categories, um, and based on that treaty and the concluding observations which are made at its review by human rights committee experts, we can see another big difference because the treaty reviews are actually reviewed by the human rights committee body of experts that the UN has appointed with the obligation to review that country's record according to the particular dimensions of that treaty only. It doesn't go outside of the treaty body. And when that review happens, we in civil society get to directly participate in that review. We have very structured interactions with the Human Rights Committee experts on specific provisions of that treaty. And it's, it's a very structured lobbying process when we speak to the committee, we have certain time limits that we adhere to, um, particularly to make sure that everyone gets a chance to air their issues. So the result is that we as civil society directly participate in this review. One of the other differences is that there are no treaties that the United States has either signed or ratified that directly include social, economic, and cultural rights. So if we go to the next slide and look at the Universal Periodic Review itself, we can see that it's based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that we signed on to. This is not a federal law. This is not a treaty that is capable of being ratified but it is something that we have pledged to try and uphold. There are other things included because the Universal Declaration of Rights is so much broader that there are bodies of international law that are included and we can bring up treaty violations that relate to the Declaration of Human Rights at the Universal Periodic Review. One of the really most important things for us to recognize is that this review, uh, the UPR review, is a peer review. Our government is reviewed by the governments of all of the other nation states of the UN. It is not done by a human rights committee of experts. And because of that, we do not directly participate in the actual review so that when the actual review takes place in Geneva in May, the review will be done by other states who will make recommendations and ask questions. But we do not have any participation directly in that process. So we must advocate before that review to try and make sure that all of our issue areas and questions that we want asked and recommendations are brought up by 
the peer nations reviewing the United States. So in order to do that, we have a little bit different process. And we're going to be advocating in two locations. As you can see from the next slide, we'll be advocating, where are we going to do it? We're going to do it in Geneva. And in Geneva, we're going to do it in person the week of March 16th, 2015. Now, the review itself, as I said, isn't until May, but our advocacy work needs to be done leading up to the May review because of the fact that by the time the peer review people, the nation states, get to Geneva to actually confront the United States during their review, they will already have formulated all of their questions and recommendations. Now, we can do it in Geneva not only in person, because we can't all go to Geneva, certainly not all the time anyway, and we can do it by email, and we can do it by Skype or GoToMeeting side events. And those we will be setting up, and Joshua might talk more about those. And on the next slide, we can see that we're also going to be advocating here in the United States. And this is really important because this is a lot more, um, most of us are a lot more able to advocate more frequently here in the United States than in Geneva. So we have, of course, the United Nations in New York City, and that's a good place for advocacy. We are also going to be having consultations at various colleges and universities in the country, which we will be inviting missions to so that they can have an opportunity to hear our concerns and, and receive our proposed questions and recommendations. We also can do this by conference call set up between work groups or individual organizations and missions, by email through the missions, by Skype, and it's all going to be happening now through September of 2015. And I know that Josh and Amy and others are going to talk more about these things. And so I will defer to them for most of that. And I think we have the next slide is now in order. And I will, at this point, turn the presentation over to uh, my colleague and co-chair, Joshua and Yolande. Thank you, Mary, so much. Um, I just reminded to folks that this call is an hour and a half, so if you do need to leave in the first hour, be sure to use the chat feature on the left side to type questions that our presenters will be happy to um, answer um, both at the end of the session and, if possible, um, during the session itself, um, so that way we can ask your question if you get off early. Um, and so next we're going to have Joshua um, talk a bit about um, our process of advocating in the U.S., specifically the country um, uh, consultations uh, and diplomacy dialogues. Um, Josh, if you tell us a bit about the strategy for those um, and some of the upcoming opportunities. Sure. Aloha. It's an honor to talk to everyone and be on this webinar. And the idea behind these UPR diplomacy dialogues and country consultations is that we really do have a unique opportunity to be able to speak to the embassies in Washington, D.C., but unlike a lot of other countries, we also have the U.N. headquarters based in New York. So in a way, we get two bites at the apple to be able to make sure that we can share what questions we really want posed and what recommendations we think would be most advantageous to us doing advocacy here in the United States. And as Mary said, it's really important for us to know that we give the questions and recommendations, and then the states, all 192 other states, can ask questions and make recommendations, as well as even observer nations, uh, such as the Holy See and uh, Palestine. So this new format in the second cycle is extra 30 minutes. It's 3.5 hours. It's three and a half hours. And it's also every country and every observer state can ask a question and make a recommendation, whereas in the first cycle, only the first 70 or so that registered. So 
we knew that was a great development. We know that's positive. That's one of the things we pushed for. But we also know it's very difficult to be able to meet with all of the governments. And in the first cycle, we had one great uh, diplomacy dialogue that was in uh, right before the UPR, and we met at American University. And so the idea behind this time is to actually come up with, as uh, Ilan has just showed, a series of diplomacy dialogues that happen within the same week that allow NGOs to either be in New York or DC and be able to make sure that they can share their one to two page documents by putting those out at the table, but also meeting with the missions in New York as well as the embassies in DC. So this first picture you have here is of the church center. And what we'll launch starting next week is instead of just the one time meeting in DC in New in in DC last year, we're starting next week on January twenty eighth with a meeting at the church center on the tenth floor. And the program will be similar as throughout the entire four months. But what we'll do is from nine until noon will be the diplomacy dialogue. We'll start with a panel of civil society, many of you that are on this Zoom call, and everyone will get between three to five minutes. After we finish the panel, we'll make sure that's live webcast so everybody can watch it. And then the missions that are based in New York who have signed up and are in attendance will be able to ask questions and the panel will be able to respond and then also be able to have some informal moments as well in breaks to be able to share with them the specific questions and recommendations. We think this will be quite valuable and we think it will work out really well in that it doesn't just give us one meeting but four separate meetings throughout that time period. So the first one will be on January 28th next week from 9 until noon. And then the other idea of something we're trying to do, which we don't know if it'll work out yet, although uh, Tenji will be able to talk about the positive development guaranteed for February, is we want to have the U.S. government meet with us as well once a month on the same day that we're meeting with uh, missions and embassies. So the idea is in the morning, for this first one, we will have the panel presenting from 9 to 10. Then from 10 to 12, there'll be a dialogue between the mission and the civil society. Then we'll take a break where people can still lobby and make sure the countries get our questions. And then invite the government to come and could be interested to hear what we comments where we can also then begin to look at specific recommendations we're trying to get the U.S. to be implemented and also promises that they'll make so that we'll have some results hopefully by May 11th at the first time, but guaranteed a lot more by the September where they'll actually promise to implement some of the recommendations that they've accepted at the May session. Uh, the second one that's coming up, if we look at the next slide, I believe, will be at Georgetown University. So at Georgetown on Friday, January 30th, We'll follow the same format. We'll have a panel from 9 to 10. That'll be a uh, live webcast. And then from 10 to 12, we'll be able to have the panel answer questions and have a deeper discussion with the embassy, their human rights officers that are coming. And then we'll take a break. And then once again, from 1 to 3, uh, try to get the U.S. government to engage with us and then be able to coordinate. The exciting thing, is February, we'll be meeting at Howard University on uh, February 20th, and Tenji will get into that in more detail. But on February 18th, we'll be meeting at uh, City University of New York Law School, just two stops on the metro from the actual UN, and we'll have our second UPR diplomacy dialogue and country consultation during that week in February. Then in March, we'll also be having our UPR diplomacy dialogues and country consultations. We'll be having them at at uh, Columbia University. We've already agreed on the March 27th date. And then we'll also be having a meeting at the UDC School of Law. We'll be meeting there that same week. And then the final one that we'll have, I think the next slide shows, is in April uh, 15th through 17th, we'll actually be having our final UPR Diplomacy Dialogue and Country Consultation. Uh, we'll be meeting at American University 
first in D.C. And then Fordham University has agreed on April 16th in the afternoon, which is exciting. This is one more chance. But then the big one will be there at the Roosevelt House in Midtown Manhattan that's connected with Hunter College and their human rights program. And that will be the same format, as I talked about earlier, of 9 to noon, with the first hour being our panel presentations by civil society. Many people on these calls can sign up for those slots. And then the 10 to 12 being the dialogue. And then the final hopeful country consultation with the US will be from 1 to 3. And then that will allow us to have networked with the countries that Mary talked about that will be able to put the question forward on May 11th. This will then get us in a good place that if you're not able to go to Geneva, because so many of us do great work at the grassroots level and can't get there on the March meeting, that you will have been able to put your questions and recommendations in your one to two pagers directly to the people who will make the interventions for us on our behalf on May 11th. So that is the UPR Diplomacy Dialogues and Country Consultations. They're an expansion of our original activities from the first cycle where we had one at American University. And the idea behind it is that if we get this series going, then that means when we meet in Geneva, the one the actual uh, UPR should have a lot more recommendations. Last time we had the most recommendations of any country. And it's not necessarily that the US is the worst country, although we know the problems it does have. It was based on the great advocacy we did to put those issues forward and get them in a concise manner for countries to understand them. That's our one to two pagers. But two, what will be important is the town hall meeting. The U.S. government will be having that on Monday afternoon for at least 90 minutes. And that's great because then we meet directly with the specific officers in the agencies and departments that are responsible for specific uh, recommendations that will be made. One of the things we're pushing for is that if the U.S. government gets used to this practice and they have, we have great things on February 20th, then we can actually pick dates for June and July after our actual UPR review in May so that we all know when we have to get to DC next. Otherwise, usually it's always, as we all know, sprung on us and it's very difficult for us to get there and to do that. So uh, we appreciate everyone uh, coming in. Uh, we'll be sending out the flyers as well. And we'll make sure, don't worry about writing down the dates. Penelope uh, from New Jersey, we'll have all those sent out. Uh, Kenji has them. We just didn't want to overwhelm people with the last email talking about all the things that are happening with those dates. But everyone is open and can participate in those Washington, D.C. and New York UPR Diplomacy Dialogues and Country Consultations. And they'll hopefully be a great addition for many people to be able to make sure their issues are heard. So thank you very much. I'm willing to answer questions later. Mahalo. Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, just a, a clarifying question, which is, um, what should people think about in terms of deciding which of those um, that you've laid out? I know at one point there was a, con a consideration to do thematic-based um, structures. Is that still the case? Or um, how should people decide if uh, resources or a concern, which of those to attend? Great question. What we'll be doing is um, we looked at it a couple of different ways. We didn't want to just arbitrarily say everyone has to come to this one and people might be like not a good time for them. So we've said that it's open, especially this first one. We want to do a broad overview. And then there's two ideas. One is we'll assign working groups and working groups on the task force can actually tell us we'd rather be at February, March, or April. And the other one is also thinking UPR is part of this entire human rights movement, and that whatever treaty body that would like to do their follow-up, they could also adopt one of those months, and we would work around that. So it's, it's open that way. And if you can only go to one, even though the other we decide different themes for those, we'll still make sure people can be included and make sure it's uh, allowed for all people to participate when they can make it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hopefully that's um, and so, as Josh has mentioned, you know there are several opportun many opportunities for you to engage. Um, and as, she, as he also mentioned, um, Tenjiwe will talk more about um, the the bigger one that we have planned for February 20th with more details um, and a breakdown of um, the purpose and uh, expected outcomes for that one. 
Um, so before we actually turn to that, I'm going to have my colleague um, Amy Burquist and J.R. Tom, uh, Thompson, who uh, <clears throat> is with the Lambda Legal, do a walkthrough of um, how you actually find those countries that um, – are likely to address your issue by doing a, a brief walkthrough of the uh, UPR info database um, and how to using um, RJ's uh, submission report as an example of how you'll do that. So Amy and RJ. Hi everyone, this is Amy Burquist from the Advocates for Human Rights and RJ, you didn't get an introduction at the beginning, so RJ, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about who you are in Lambda Legal and the particular one pager that you have written that we're going to talk about as we do the run through in just a moment. Thank you so much for that. Uh, my name is RJ Thompson. I am the Fair Courts Project Community Educator at Lambda Legal, which is the nation's oldest and largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and HIV legal organization, and I also serve on the board of directors of the U.S. Human Rights Network. So um, Lambda Legal uh, wrote a stakeholder report for this round of UPR, and we're very excited to touch on several issues related to policing and criminalization of LGBT people and people living with HIV in the United States. Uh, and for this exercise, um, we chose one of our one-page advocacy tools to focus on, which is on the issue of HIV criminalization. For those who don't know, there are dozens of states in the United States that have laws that are specifically fashioned to create or heighten criminal penalties for people living with HIV. Uh, and in some places, people with HIV are charged, incarcerated, and permanently designated as sex offenders for consensual adult sexual activity. Um, so that is the issue that we're focused on for this particular one pager. Great, thanks, RJ. And so RJ has his one. What Lambda, Lambda Legal has their one pager ready to go. They have their issues. They know what they want to, what recommendations they want to see coming out of the UPR on May 11th, and they also know that they want the U.S. government to accept those recommendations. So the next step in the process is for RJ and his colleagues at Lambda Legal to figure out which countries to target. If they had all the time and resources in the world, they could target every single country in the world, but a lot of organizations decide to be uh, more, more refined in their approach. And a great way to track down good countries that would be receptive to your issues is to use the UPR Info database. So you see that up on the screen right now. It's upr-info.org. And if you go to the main screen, you'll see a link to the database. So I would tell RJ, go to that screen and click to the database, and we'll go on to the next slide and take a look at what it looks like. Something that's good to know as you navigate the database are the abbreviations they use, and I've circled them there. You have the names of the columns. SUR is the state under review. So for the US UPR, the United States is going to be the state under review. RS stands for the recommending state. That's the government that's actually making the recommendation. Um, and then most important is, and also important for our purposes is which cycle. We're now in the second cycle of the U U Universal Periodic Review, so there hasn't yet been a second cycle for the United States. States, so we'd go back and look at the first cycle to see what happened before. But there are other countries that ha have already been through the second cycle of review, so that's important to take a look at. So let's move on to the next, next page, and we'll take a look. And for the first tier of your outreach, you want to take a look at see what happened in the first round of review for the United States and see whether any countries raised your issues or something similar or related to your issues. So what you're going to do on the database, if you see this, RJ, you're going to click under State Under Review and select United States. And that will tell us what recommendations were made to the United States. So you'll select that, and then you don't even need to change the cycle because there's only been one cycle for the United States, and just click Go. And if we go to the next screen, it will give us um, – all are, oh, and then before we do that, you have a drop-down list of issues that UPR Info has created. And when RJ and I talked briefly um, yesterday, we looked through the list of issues and 
RJ thought that the closest issue related to criminalization of HIV AIDS would probably be the issue labeled HIV AIDS. So that would be a starting point. And we're limiting our search to recommendations only. There are also voluntary pledges, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll focus in on the recommendations. So we've selected United States as a state under review. The issue we've selected for our first go at this is HIV AIDS, and we're going to look at the recommendations, and now let's see what our results are. Which recommendations were made in 2010 to the United States on HIV AIDS, um, which, re which recommendations were there? So let's look at our results. And there were no results. <laughs> so what that tells us, at least according to UPR Info's database, which, which is generally pretty up to date, is that no government made a recommendation to the United States relating to HIV AIDS. So, RJ, what, what's your response in seeing that result? Is, is that discouraging or encouraging, or, or what are your thoughts? Um, I think for us it would be actually encouraging in the sense that uh, we would – be even more excited to raise the issue and make sure that a constructive recommendation is uh, presented by one or more countries in this round of UPR since we know that this is a human rights violation in the United States that has not um, apparently been raised before in this venue. Great. Yeah, so that doesn't mean that you should just give up and say, oh, I guess we have to randomly choose countries or, you know, select all of them. We can do some more searches using this database. So let's move on to the next screen. And what RJ and I did uh, yesterday was we looked through some of the other issues, and RJ thought that maybe the right to health would be also relevant to the issues raised in the report because of criminalization of HIV could implicate the right to health. And as it turns out, in the last round of the UPR of the United States, there were three different recommendations made to the United States relating to the right to health. And RJ, as you look through those three recommendations, do any of them seem to have any overlap between your issues in your WEN page? and the recommendations that were made? Um, yes, there are multiple overlaps that I see potentially with the recommendation on undocumented migrants, access to health care. Um, that could be implicated because there are collateral consequences, immigration consequences of criminal conviction um, that include many uh, aspects of public benefit. So that's one potential overlap. Uh, and then with the third recommendation um, and non-discrimination, there's overlap there because it's disproportionately the criminal punishment system uh, and HIV both disproportionately impact people of color. Uh, and again, with collateral consequences, it could be tied to housing um, and health disparities as well as criminal punishment. Great. So it looks like we have Bolivia, Cuba, and Brazil. Those were the recommending states. And those might be countries that you'd want to reach out to with your one pager. And when you reach out to them by email or by telephone or if you meet them in person, you can first thank them for making this recommendation during the last round of the UPR of the United States, say this is really great, and we have these issues that overlap with what your issues were you raised the last time. So that can be a way to initiate a conversation that gets them on the same page to show that common ground. So what I would do in this case, or if I were at Lambda Legal, is I would copy and paste these recommendations and the names of the governments that made them. And I would also note, if you look in the fourth column, it gives the response. And that means the response from the United States. And if you've been on these training calls before, you know that in the UN, recommendations are not accepted or rejected. They are accepted or noted. And noted is UN speak for rejected. Um, so you might want to keep track of that as well. It doesn't mean you wouldn't reach out to Brazil because their recommendation wasn't accepted. But it's, it's just some additional information to keep in mind as you um, craft your email or prepare for a conversation with one of the diplomats from Brazil. So you copy that into your database, and th those might be sort of your tier one countries to reach out to because they expressed interest in related issues during the last review. But that's not the end of the game. It, it certainly can be. If you have only the time and resources to reach out to three governments, maybe that's what you want to stick to and just target those three governments. But there's more you can do if you have the time and capacity. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, you can try some other issues to see whether they overlap. So another issue RJ and I tried yesterday was there's, there's a, an issue area for sexual orientation and gender identity. 
And you can see from the results of this search for the first round of the United States, there were two recommendations to the United States about sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, one recommendation from Uruguay and one from Australia. And RJ, in looking at those recommendations, do they have any overlap with the issues you'd want to raise? Yes, I think that uh, recommendation 86 from Uruguay has overlap in that uh, one of our recommendations we would hope to get is some sort of public education campaign to combat bias and stereotypes against people living with HIV, including um, scientifically based means of transmission rather than just stigma based stereotypes. And as we know, there is a uh, conflation between LGBT identities as well as uh, people who are engaging in the sex trade and sex workers um, at being HIV positive or profiled as such. And so there's overlap between those two groups as well on this issue. Great. So you may want to add Uruguay and Australia to your list. And you can also look that both of those recommendations were accepted as well. So that gives you a little bit more perspective to look at. So now we have five countries on your list, RJ, for reaching out. And if you're in for more, then we can go on to the next screen and take a look at another approach. And this I call your Tier 1 target. So you can look, at, look for governments that didn't necessarily make a recommendation to the United States in the last round of review, but may have made recommendations to other governments during the UPR process that relate to your issues. So maybe last time they just missed the ball with the United States, but maybe it's a new issue that they're really getting engaged in. So for this kind of a search, you'd go back and change the state under review to all. So we'll open it up more broadly. And then go back to what you think is the closest issue that relates. So we changed that issue back to HIV AIDS. And then because some governments' priorities change over time, I recommend that you limit your search to the second cycle. Because sometimes governments focused on one thing in the first cycle, and now they're fi figuring things out a little bit differently, and they may have different priorities. So we'll just look at the second cycle, and we'll look at the issue of HIV-AIDS, and we'll look at the governments that made recommendations on that topic in HIV-AIDS for the second cycle of review. So this will give us some other potential ideas for governments to reach out to, and let's see what we get for the results of that search. So here you get a lot of results. We have 86 we have 86 different results, and I'm sorry, I know that there's getting feedback. I'm, I'm using the handset on my phone, so I don't know why, why there's the feedback. Um, so we have 86 results, and one thing that you can do if you want to see who's making the most recommendations on a particular issue, then if you look at the column where it says RS, that's the recommending state, and that little triangle, if you click on it twice, it will sort the recommending states in alphabetical order. So you'll see all of the A countries clumped together, and that gives you a more easy visual image of which countries are making a lot of recommendations on, in this case, the issue of HIV AIDS. So let's click forward to the next slide, and I'll show you how that looks. And here we have it sorted in alphabetical order. The first country that comes up is Algeria. And Algeria has made three recommendations during the second cycle of, of UPR on issues of HIV AIDS. And they made them, as you can see in the first column, to Barbados, Botswana, and Zambia. And then Angola has made one, Argentina has made three, and you can just go through the list sorted in that way. And one thing you can do, RJ, is take a look at the recommendations they've made, and they may or may not be specifically related to your issues, but see whether that seems like th those seem like the kind of countries that, um, because of the recommendations they're making, they'd be sympathetic to your issues. Um, so just take a look at Algeria there, and does Algeria seem like a government that would be sy sympathetic to your particular issues uh, related to criminalization of people who have HIV/AIDS? Um, potentially, but I feel like I would need a little more information because there's nothing that's specifically around criminalization that's mentioned in the recommendations. But if they're pursuing, recommending pursuing efforts to combat um, the pandemic, you know, there's a possibility there that they may be interested. But I would, I would be unsure because nothing there is specific to criminalization. Sure. And, sure, and you can go down the list, and you can prioritize them to look at which ones seem closer to closer more more closely aligned to your issues, and which ones might be a bit of a stretch. And if you have time, reach out to all of them. And if you don't, just stick with the top priorities. So let's go on to the next slide. 
Um, another thing you can do using the UPR info database, and it's not a very rigorous tool, but you can use the keyword search. So you can you have your results with, with you know dozens of results for HIV AIDS in the second cycle, and you can search through those results using a keyword search. Um, so I entered in discrim to pick up discrimination, discriminate, etc., and that narrowed our results to 12 recommendations that talk about HIV AIDS and also talk about discrimination. So that might be another way to sort of narrow down which countries you'd want to focus on. Now, another thing we might want to look at is, does, are there any governments that make recommendations on HIV AIDS and also talk about criminalization or crime? So let's try a different keyword search on our next slide to see if we come up with anything there. So searching for the word criminal, we didn't get any results. Um, and we did the same search with crime and criminalization. There were no results. And what, what does that say to you, RJ, that, that no government in the second round of the UPR has made a recommendation on HIV AIDS that talks about criminalization or crime? Um, well, a couple of things. For one, it made me want to research what the status of HIV criminalization is in other countries globally, what the situation is, if it's just the United States, again, being a human rights outlier, or if this is a problem in other countries as well. Um, and then again, as I said earlier, it made me more, uh, even more excited to raise the issue in my lobbying of, of states to make recommendations in this round, since it seems to be an issue that has been um, under the radar thus far in the UPR. Yeah, so it's, it's a great opportunity then to, to be creative about reaching out to countries to see if you can get, get traction for your issue this time around. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, another thing you can do is learn more. We have your short list of five countries so far, RJ, and we had Bolivia, Cuba, Brazil, Uruguay, and Australia. Another thing you do is get to know those governments a little bit more. So we'd look at, for example, Bolivia. Um, and we can look at all of the recommendations Bolivia has made during the second cycle. So they've, ma they've made a few recommendations on HIV AIDS, and we can look at what are they focusing on over the past few years. Do they have any particular areas of interest that might overlap with you, uh, with, with your issues that you want to raise, or have they completely gone in a different direction? So we can do a search like that, um, limiting it to the second cycle, limiting it to just Bolivia. So we'll look at just the recommendations Bolivia has been making. And if we go on to the next screen, we'll see this list, all of the rec 77 recommendations Bolivia has made in the second cycle. And you, you can look at which governments it's making recommendations to. Some governments don't want to make recommendations to the United States. They may, might be fearful of repercussions if they're dependent on the United States for um, assistance, or they, they might have other concerns, and, or some governments might just make recommendations to countries in their own region of the world. So it's useful to take a look at that. And then you can look at what the recommendations are and whether overall Bolivia's approach or Cuba's approach or Brazil's approach, that overall they seem to be touching on issues that would be related to you, or maybe they are going in a completely different direction. So that's another way to get to know your countries you're targeting before you craft that email and reach out to them. Um, so another, let's go on to the next slide. And I'm seeing a great suggestion from Penelope over in the, com in the chat section. I hope you'll all take a look at that. Um, another, you can, you can take an, another thing I was thinking of, of about is what are, what are some other criminalization issues that might overlap with HIV AIDS? So I, I conducted a search looking at sexual orientation and gender identity for the second cycle and just search for the word criminal. Uh, because I know that there are a lot of countries that will criminalize same-sex conduct. Uh, so we came up with 103 results, countries making recommendations on criminalization related to sexual orientation and gender identity. And so, RJ, that might be, I know we, we didn't do this, have time to do this yesterday, but that might be another category of recommendations to look through for countries you might want to target for your advocacy. What do you think about doing that approach? Is that sending you in the wrong direction, or would that be helpful in terms of identifying more countries? Um, I think this is helpful in that there's specific re recommendations around criminalizing sexual relations between consenting adults, which is very relevant to the issue of HIV criminalization and enhanced penalties for people living with HIV. Great. And, and this is, a, this is a, another message to think creatively and don't give up if your first search doesn't work. Uh, keep, keep making attempts to play with the database to come up with your results. 
Now let's go on to the next slide. Um, and the, the next couple of slides are just about once you have your list of countries you want to reach out to, how do you find out how to email them? So go into your favorite search engine and enter Permanent Mission UN Geneva to find the Geneva email addresses. And that first search result will take you to our next slide, which is the missions in Geneva. And it's very straightforward, and you just click on Bolivia, Cuba, Brazil, etc., and then it will take you to the next slide which gives you the email and the telephone number for the Geneva-based mission of that country. And that's, those are the people who are going to be the ones on the Human Rights Council floor actually making the recommendations. So you can email that information. You can try to set up a, a call with them if you're not going to be able to go to Geneva. And if you are going to Geneva, then see if you can set up an in-person meeting to talk with them about your issues. But in that email, you're going to, I think we had in the last training, really good sample emails from Eric Tars, uh, what to say in that email and attach your one pager, of course, and um, try to get the ball rolling. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we have another idea for advocacy on outreach. If you're not able to go to Geneva, you can still send those emails, but you can also reach out to the embassies and consulates here in the United States. So you can participate in the consultations that Joshua talked about, but you can also try to set up your own one-on-one -on -one meetings either with the embassy in Washington, D.C., or with the consulate if you're like, the Advocates for Human Rights. We're based in Minnesota, so we don't have the funds to go to D.C., and so we have a few consulates here in Minnesota that we can do advocacy with as well. So that's another tip for actually getting your one-pagers in the hands of the people that can then pass on the information to their colleagues in Geneva with the hopes that they'll make recommendations aligned with what your issues are. So, RJ, any final thoughts about how, how we went through this process and what you'll want to do next? Um, thank you so much. It's very, very helpful. So we'll be uh, following the same process for each of the one-pager issue areas that we've selected from our stakeholder report. Um, and I think there's a, even within this one issue, there's a great deal of opportunity for lobbying and advocacy. Um, and between the calls, emails, one-on-one -on -one meetings, stateside and Geneva, um, I think for pretty much any human rights issue domestically that folks are working on, there's multiple avenues for advocacy in the next few months. Great. Well, thanks very much, RJ, for being our guinea pig. And I'll hand it off now to Tenjiwe, I think is going to talk about the February 20th consultation in a little bit more detail. Thank you so much, um, RJ and, um, and Amy. And, and my sincerest apologies, RJ. I think it's an oversight with the pictures on the on the first screen. Um, I will make it up to you. Um, so now that you've heard uh, about the UPR in the context of what it uh, how it compares to the the treaty review process, and Joshua has gone through um, a list of seven or eight um, <clears throat> opportunities for you to you know get a bite of the apple, if you will. Um, we want to talk about um, an upcoming opportunity that the, the network and the uh, task force um, are, are coordinating on February 20th. Um, and I'll turn over to my colleague, Tenji Wei, to talk about um, you know, when, where that will be um, and what are the opportunities that look like and how it will be organized. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and thank you to Yolande and to others that just presented, um, and particularly to Josh, who shared quite a bit about uh, the purpose and what we hope to accomplish from the country consultation and the diplomacy dialogue. Um, as he mentioned, um, and as I will reiterate, the goals from um, the, the consultations and the, and the diplomacy dialogue, um, and particularly the goal for our February 20th event, uh, essentially a, a, a lobby event, is to is to one, to try to give as much as possible an overview of the state of human rights in the U.S., particularly to embassies that we want to attend, um, as well as to elevate economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, other goals that we have for the February 20th um, event is also to provide an opportunity to distribute the one-pagers that were discussed earlier, um, again, as well as to establish um, or to provide a opportunity for people to interact and connect with the various different embassies. And so that's a bit about the, the purpose and the goals. And one that I forgot to mention is it's also an opportunity to elevate some of what we call the concluding observations 
um, that came out of previous reviews. And so much of what has been recommended as well as some of the outcomes of previous reviews that we have participated in, particularly in 2013, um, with the review on torture, uh, review on discrimination in the U.S. as well as the U.S. Anyway, you're breaking up. Um, can you repeat that um, last point? Sure. So, the last point to wanting to elevate some of what we call the concluding observations. And so, specifically, some of the, the recommendations and the outcomes from previous reviews that we've uh, attended, and particularly the review that happened last year on torture, the review that again happened last year on racial discrimination, and lastly, the review on civil and political rights, as well as um, some of what came out of the last uh, UPR uh, review on the US. And so that covers some of the goals and the purpose. To be brief on structure, what we're hoping to do in terms of the program is to organize a plenary, again, to try to give as much as possible an overview um, and cover as much issue areas as we can as well as then afterwards provide an opportunity for breakout sessions based on issue area. Um, for, uh, in terms of logistics, uh, the location of the February 20th event is Howard University and the time is 1, 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, we do have uh, uh, scholarships available and we'll be sharing more information soon um, as to how to apply. Um, we do have a, a, a bit of funds um, to fund for some folks um, and again, we'll, we'll be sharing information soon about how people can apply for either a full or partial scholarship to D.C. on February 20th. And lastly, as, as Josh mentioned, um, what we've been trying to do is also uh, help coordinate the U.S. government consultations. Um, and uh, we, you know, we're happy to, to share that we will have a U.S. government consultation on the same day of February 20th. Um, and we're looking to have it from, or they're looking to have it, um, and we're still confirming with them from 9 a.m. to noon. Um, and we're hoping that we can work with them to coordinate as much of a meaningful dialogue between civil society and the U.S. government, particularly on the Universal Periodic Review. And I'll stop. And I'll stop there, Yolani. Thank you so much, Cindy Wei. And uh, and um, if folks have questions but need to get off the phone um, before the hour is up, I um, encourage you to use the chat as you've all been using it nicely um, to ask your question that we'll be able to answer and you'll have access to the recording of this uh, webinar that will be distributed um, later today or very early tomorrow morning. So thank you so much, Tinji Wei, for talking about the consultations of the 20th. Um, and I'll turn next to um, just to sort of round this out in terms of how do we move from advocating stateside um, to plan for um, our engagement, our delegation in Geneva, and turn to our UPR, uh, our Human Rights Outreach Coordinator, Rebecca Landy, to give us um, a sense of when we plan to be in Geneva um, and how folks can begin to prepare to engage if they plan to go. Great. Thank you, Yolande. Um, so, Yolande, if you want to turn to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so um, as you all may have seen, if you received an email from the network, but if not, if you're seeing for the first time, we'll be sending folks to Geneva to advocate, as we said, in March, um, the week of March 16th through 20th. Um, and scholarships are available for that time period. And um, I'm going to show you during this webinar um, where you can find that scholarship page um, and some of the details about the scholarship application. The actual review will take place on May 11th um, in the morning, um, which is a Monday in Geneva, but um, we'll, we won't be having scholarships for that because the, uh, it will be too late for advocacy at that point. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, Yolan, please. So um, as I said, um, the reason we're sending folks in March for the 16th through the 20th is so that there's um, enough time for lobbying to happen. As we spoke about, um, governments need to make um, their decisions about questions um, ahead of time before that May 11th session. Um, so there's some other events going on in Geneva during this time period of March 16th through 20th, and it's part of the reason why we chose this time period. Um, so the Human Rights Council session will be happening at this time. 
Um, and at the same time, the Human Rights Committee and the 113th session of the ICCPR will also be happening during this time period. Um, and then um, in May, in that, as I said, in the morning on May 11th, um, UN member states um, we'll be reviewing the U.S. record in the morning, and then um, the U.S. government has told us that they'd like to have a town hall event um, in Geneva in the afternoon. So as soon as we have more details about that, we'll send it out to the network as well. Then next slide, please, Yolande. So um, we'll be organizing um, a calendar of events um, during the delegation happening in March. We'll really be focusing on advocacy of the Human Rights Council. Um, and we'll, and you'll have a lot of opportunities for lobbying. Um, we'll make sure that there's um, time to lobby both formally and um, informally um, in the halls of the UN. And we'll be having um, two side events as well. Uh, additionally, um, we'll try to organize some potential special mandate holder meetings and other high level UN official meetings. Next slide, please, Yolanda. So, as I mentioned, um, what what's happening during that session, um, March 16th through 20th, is that there's some other um, programs that are already happening at the UN. And so, um, in addition to the calendar of events that USHRN will be organizing, we'll also be able to um, take part in some of these other events. As you can see, um, for example, there's a discussion, um, a debate on the state of racial discrimination worldwide on that. Um, Friday that may be of interest to some people. Um, there's also other UPR, co other country UPRs happening at the same time, and so there'll be an opportunity to see um, what will be happening with the U.S. Um, come May. Um, and there's some other sessions you can see uh, on Thursday, for example, on the 19th, there's a panel on national policies and human rights, and this can all be found um, on the U.N. website as well. So the next slide, please, Yolanda. Um, so, as I mentioned, as we said before, there'll be time to advocate um, in Geneva, um, both um, in formal uh, halls, as you see on the right here, um, and then also more informally, uh, you know, over coffee, perhaps you could ask some of the delegates to meet with you or go to their offices. Um, and Amy talked about, you know, sending emails beforehand or calling or sending letters. Um, so that you can make those arrangements. So the next slide. Thanks. So um, this is just um, where you'll find what the travel scholarship application page looks like. Um, apologies, it's kind of my internal page, but this is what it looks like. Um, and there's important information here about it. Um, and Yolanda, if you can go to the next slide, please. So here's the URL where you can actually find um, the travel scholarship application. Again, the scholarships will cover either partial or full travel um, uh, and hotel in Geneva from March 16th through 20th. The deadline for applications is 5 p.m. on February 4th. So it's coming up pretty soon and we will not consider any late applications. So please make sure you get those in on time. Um, all the details about you know what are the preferred qualifications are on our website on that page you just saw beforehand. Um, but one important one is that we'll, we'll be giving priority to those who have not received scholarships for us in the past. Um, we also prioritize organizations and um, individuals who are dues, pending, due pay, dues paying members of the network and people directly impacted by human rights violations. Um, and, you know, we give consideration to broad representation of issues and grassroots organizations with limited resources. Um, and those who are active with the USHRN task forces or working groups or committees. So that's just a little bit about the scholarships. Um, and then could you go to the next slide, please? Yolande, is there? The next slide, please. Um, if it's not showing on your side, it should be up. It's a question slide. Okay. Okay. I thought there was one last slide. Okay. So then 
that's it. Um, and I guess we'll turn to the questions now. Um, I know that there's been a lot of questions on the side and some of them I think have been answered in the chat function. There's also um, an opportunity to, for people to raise their hands, which I believe you'll be helping coordinate, but I'll be also um, reading off some of these chat questions that haven't been answered um, and turning to my colleagues who have presented um, and others on the phone, perhaps from the task force, who might be able to answer these questions. So let's look and see um, what sort of questions. I know there was um, an, a question, one question about um, the reports that were submitted to the UN or the UPR. Um, and in terms of what's on the USHR website right now, um, only those summaries or reports that were submitted to us to be included in our executive summary are currently on the website. Um, once the UN has put the report along with the compilation report, we'll also post that on our website and to the networks. Um, there was a question about working groups. Um, if you tried to sign up for a working group and had some issues, I, I apologize. I sent out the link again um, about for the working group. Um, so, and Mary also sent out her information. So please um, try to sign up again. Anyone can join a, a working group. Uh, there's so you shouldn't be you shouldn't have received um, a rejection or something like that. Um, anyone is able to join. Um, um, Rebecca, I wanted to do a follow-up question on the on the working group, um, and I'll put this sure. to um, Josh or Mary or any of the uh, task force co-chair uh, um, members, which is um, how should people think about their participation in the working groups, um, especially in light of if they can't be at any of the consultations? What would you say in terms of encouraging them to join a working group if they may not have been thinking of doing it or haven't yet done so? Uh, this is Mary, and I'd like to say that I think one of the great things about the working group is that people can join no matter what participation level they're able to have. Um, and they can not only form new alliances that with groups that are interested in their issue, but they can also collaborate on one pagers and on advocacy so that, for example, if in my working group I can't go to a consultation in DC, uh, everyone in my working group is going to make sure that my one pager and my issue are brought up at that time anyway. Same with Geneva or anywhere else. So some people, um, most working groups are compiling a fairly broad one pager that touches on uh, overarching issues in their work group, and then frequently there are other uh, one pagers written by organizations in the work group that are issues maybe unique to their work, so that it gives you an opportunity to expand your advocacy and expand your knowledge and your connections. Thanks so much, um, Mary. Um, and if Rebecca, if you proceed with the question. I echo that. I'm sorry, Josh, were you saying something? Oh, I was just going to say, echo that point that uh, Mary brought up, and that's one of the best aspects of the network that I've seen, is that I know people who weren't able to go to Geneva for some of the treaty body work, and we really had great people who would still questions and recommendations for groups that they had worked on in the working group. So even if you can't go to any of the meetings, everyone does a really good job at speaking out and one, I know a person had two or three questions at the CAT, so then they were like, how can I help to make sure that other people haven't had their question asked yet? I'll go take my question, I'll take your question forward on your behalf. So that's one of the benefits, I think, of the working group and the network. Thank you. Um, and I would say as we move on with the questions, um, I would encourage folks to try out um, what Amy has gone through in terms of using the UPR info database. So in case you run into any problems, uh, you can ask them in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, for example. Uh, Rebecca, please continue with the question. Sure. So um, the next question is from Julia Perez. And Julia asks if we know which embassy representatives will be present at the upcoming event. Um, and that's a great question, Julia, and I can try to answer that. And then I'll let um, 
my colleagues, perhaps Tenjue or Josh, also help. Um, but I think at least for the February 20th event, we'll be um, sending out invitations to embassies and, uh, and hopefully before the event um, happens, we'll be able to send um, network members uh, a list of who will be attending. Um, Joshua Tenji, do you have anything to add to that? I I don't have very much to add. I think uh, Rebecca, you you answered it well. Um, again, you, it's the target is, is getting as many um, embassies, uh, particularly staffers, uh, to attend. Um, and for the in, in terms of the U.S. government consultation on the 20th, I think what we'll expect is a similar delegation that has come in the past. And so members of the, the State Department, particularly the uh, democracy, human, human rights and labor um, part of it, as well as um, the Department of Justice and a number of different agencies throughout the U.S. government. And so we are hoping to get a list of del the, del the U.S. delegation that's going to attend on the 20th in advance of the consultation. Um, and if we do, we hope to share that with others. Yeah, I agree with that. One of the reasons why we came up with the schedule of four months is that on the 28th and 30th, we'll announce the February 20th and the March dates and the April dates. So then that allows everyone to actually know who's coming far out because what has always been happening so far with a lot of consultations with the country is a week or two notice and then it's very hard for everybody to know if they should attend. So we hope when we put those dates out, and we start as soon as we hear back from missions and embassies, as well as from the U.S. government who's coming, we'll start having that available for people on the task force and engaging in task force calls and working group calls and uh, future webinars as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joshua. Um, Oh, great, there's some more questions coming in on the side. And, and there's one comment that I just want to make sure everyone saw from Amy who wanted to add to her presentation um, about using UPR info, and that um, it's important to note that um, connectors don't work in the search, for example, and or or. So make sure that you don't put those in when you're doing your search. Otherwise, you won't come up with um, any results, or you might not come up with any results on your issue. Um, we have a question from Krista, which I think is a, is a great one. It's, her question is, some of these countries are extreme human rights violators themselves. How do we choose the country to discuss um, our issue? Um, so I, I'm not sure if somebody else wants to answer that. I think, you know, if you have the capacity um, and, de and depending on what your own work plan is, you might want to try to target every single country who's mentioned your issue before. Um, but I don't know if others have comments to add to that. Amy or Josh, um, any suggestion about how you um, target a country based on their own human rights record? Or this decide which one to reach out to. This is Amy. Am I muted? You're unmuted. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, I would say I, you know, I have reached out to countries that have pretty horrible human rights records, doing advocacy for the UPR. Um, you know, a recommendation is a recommendation, and just because a recommendation is coming from an egregious human rights violator doesn't mean that the United States government is going to ignore it. They still have to respond, whether they accept the recommendation or note it. Um, but in doing my outreach to those countries, I may be a little bit more guarded. I, you know, in some cases, my email would say, thank you for your leadership on these important issues. It's really important. Uh, but I'm not going to thank a, a you know, major human rights violator for their, their leadership on human rights. I, I typically will say, thank you for your interest in these issues, and here, here, here's our information. So, uh, But, you know, it, it's really, you know, sort of an organizational call as well. You certainly, you, your organization may not want to be in a position of even reaching out to those organizations, uh, to those countries that are major human rights violators. So it's something you may want to discuss internally with your organization about what you're going to do. Yeah, and I can give two examples of um, trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. I agree first and foremost that the recommendation is a recommendation. So if they'll read the recommendation that you worded it and you can do things with it to realize those recommendations at home and bring human rights home, then that's great. Uh, one thing we try to do with uh, the Cuba is 
Josh, I'm sorry, your line is going in and out. Josh, I have to. Your line is going in and out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I was going to. I was talking about the example of Cuba, and that uh, Cuba. What we tried to do with them was say, we really appreciate your leadership in health and the work that you do in the right to health around the world. So instead of just the questions about maybe the Cuban Five and those issues, would you please make one about health? And then we thought that would also go over better. And they were also pleased to say, well, thank you for recognizing the work that we do. And so that was a positive thing that we did. And on the other hand, uh, Russia's ambassador would actually follow me around and would want to know when the next side event is. So at that point, we'd be like, thank you so much for coming. And here's our one pagers. But you know, we didn't feed into it. We, we you know, kind of get into that international fight between the two countries because we know it wouldn't really benefit us. So I think what Amy said is actually true is you look at which states are really champions and which states are actually doing a good job and which states ask the questions and then you decide and prioritize who will ask those questions and try to get them to raise your issues. So, uh, you know, you, once you identify them all from your info, then you, you know, make it a more fine campaign and decide who would be the best people to represent your issue and to more importantly deliver that intervention in May. Thank you so much, Joshua. Are there remaining questions, Rebecca? Well, a few people have been asking about all these calendar dates for the diplomacy dialogue consultations. And just to let everyone know, we'll be posting those to the website shortly. So if you go to our UPR page, you should be able to find them. Um, as as Tenji, we spoke about for a while, an important one to note is one of the bigger ones we'll be having in Washington, D.C. on February 20th. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of what you've both shared, Amy and Josh, in terms of how you um, craft your emails to the different um, country representatives, um, can you all speak a bit about expectations for the in-person consultation? Should um, attendees, for example, expect to have um, time to talk with different embassy representatives? And if so, um, how long can they expect? And what sort of recommendations you would make to them about how they actually go about having a conversation in person? Josh, do you want to go first on this one? Sure, sure. Uh, for the ones in, in D.C. and New York, uh, it's important to know that you'll have, you know, a five-minute intervention at the beginning. We will be able to really go over your main points and be able to describe the importance of the issue. And so that will be the first way, you know, in that presentation. The second way is, you know, countries will ask questions and rec ask questions about what your statements were, if it's based on their interests. And that's also where we have the break afterwards so that people can talk and it's not that people would run away immediately, but that you could engage with them there in that capacity. And then the other side is also in uh, Geneva. That's where we kind of do what we did in the last time, which I think was seen as a really best practice by a lot of countries, is that we were able to go into the Human Rights Council session, meet with the government quickly before the session started, ask if they were interested to meet these amazing advocates from the United States who are doing this work, who are here at this time. And we set up uh, round tables in the Serpentine where then governments would come down and sort of speed date and meet with our representatives from the working groups. And what the representatives from the working groups also had was everybody's one to two pagers. So as we have those available, we then make sure whoever has it, that they share them and pass them out to other people. So I saw there was a thing about Sierra Leone on one of the side questions. And just today, I was able to share them with uh, I had the human rights education, one to two pagers. So we shared those with the countries that all cared and have taken the lead in human rights education and said that more people will be coming in March so that they could follow up with them. So. That's really the way that you can it'll be set up in that way. And I think Tenji's come up with some good ideas, too, in February, where we'll actually, you know, 
have round tables and breakout groups for people to be able to talk. So the idea starting January 28th, this Wednesday, next Wednesday, if you're available, say you'd like to be on the panel and say what you'd want to talk about. And then uh, we'll start matching you up with countries as we see the, those, those uh, links being made. And then if you're not in New York, but DC is easier, that's at Georgetown University, and we'll do the same there. Uh, Amy, did you want to add to that or? Sure, the only thing I'll add, I think what, what Joshua said was great. I would say that if you're, um, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting or um, trying to set one up, I think a good way to start the conversation is to ask whether the, the person's government has any particular priority issues or areas of focus for the UPR. Because you'll find that some um, countries only make interventions or recommendations on particular issues. And then you, know, you don't waste your time, but you could also potentially tailor what you say going forward to fit their issues. So I think that's a, a really good strategy for making the most of your time and any one-on-one -on -one time you have with them. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and I'm going to check to see if we have any hands raised. Um, and Rebecca, if we have any questions via the chat um, that we haven't gotten to yet. Sure. Um, there was one question which Mary answered in the chat, but I can um, just point out is that um, J.M. Kirby asked about folks attending the UPR info session in April. Um, and so there's a, for those of you who are unaware, there's um, an organization, UPR Info in Geneva, who is also holding a, a pre-session in April. Um, and as Mary pointed out, um, We've been, we've been in contact with them, but um, we won't be sending a delegation um, for that April session. Um, we, we've decided to send that delegation in May um, so that it's earlier and more time to advocate, but there are potentially some USHR and people who might still be going. Um, and if you, you know, are interested in going to Geneva and unable to go in March, um, that may be an option for you to go in April if you're interested. Um, and, and just to clarify one thing that you just said, um, I, I think you misspoke when you said um, in May, but um, we plan to send the Sorry. delegation in March. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I could say one thing about the UPR info based on the conversation ahead, we had. And uh, yeah, the, I think the deadline for the that is February 8th. Uh, they're also not able, though, to give funds to any U.S. NGO. So if you are applying, you'd have to make sure you have your own funds for that. And it's important to know that it's just a one-hour session. So that the U.S. would be the first country on either that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday of that week in April. Because we know they sent that out and a lot of people got excited. It'll probably be the 9 a.m. session going just till 10. So it's a one-hour session. And it fits into that category. So that is why, as Rebecca said, we decided to take more people early and to coordinate that way to begin the advocacy earlier. But the deadline is February 8th, and it will be just for one hour. So anyone applying would have to have their own funding, and they'll just be able to participate in that one hour. And there's also a limitation how many people can speak. I believe it's between six and eight. So uh, that's also a consideration. So you may not be chosen to actually um, present as part of that one-hour meeting. One hour meeting. That's a great point. And we don't always, we won't control who they select to speak because they've cast the net wide. But we did secure today at least a discussion together a little bit better. But so those are some of the reasons on why we did decide for the march that everybody coordinated and stated so clearly. Thanks so much. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, um, so we could take a couple more questions, and then I'll point out some important links and resources that's available to you. Um, Rebecca, do we have any other questions? Uh, Rebecca, do we have any other questions? I think we've answered most of the questions. Um, I'm trying to look now to see if we missed any. Um, and one question, and I might need Krista to clarify a little bit, is she asked if there's one-on-one -on -one with the U.S. that can be scheduled. Um, so 
Krista, I don't know if you're if you're asking if exactly if there's one on one with the U.S. government during the time in in March or um, in February. Um, in, in February, um, there will be um, a meeting prior to um, the session that we're holding in the afternoon with the government. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to speak with the government then. Um, but perhaps you could just period, sorry, and in May. In, in May, Krista, there'll be um, an event in the afternoon after the actual review with the government. Um, so there'll be an opportunity again to speak with the government um, after the event. Um, usually, you know, there, there's time um, set aside afterwards where government officials stick around and you can speak with them about your issue um, at the end of the event. So I hope that answers your question. Um, otherwise, we can, can follow up and try to clarify more. Um, so I think that might be um, answers to all the questions. Um, but if you ever have any more questions, um, and ask, you can email us, um, as you can see right here. Thanks, Yolan. Perfect. Uh, you can email us at our email address, upr at ushrnetwork.org, um, and we can help answer some of your questions there. And um, please, and, and Yolan, forgive me if I'm taking over what you were going to say. Um, but please go to the network website to learn more um, and sign up for those UPR working groups so that you can, you know, collaborate with others, as we've mentioned, work on your one pagers. Um, if you're not um, able to attend um, any of these events, have others in your working group um, ask for, you know, to bring your one pagers and work on your issues um, and go to our UPR website and check out all of those resources. We've had other webinars which are recorded and on the website. This one will be recorded and on the website. Um, we have a lot of templates and resources to help you in this process and we look forward to continuing to work with you all um, to help you and we're excited to um, for the UPR. Thank you so much, Thank Becca. You, I appreciate the teamwork. the teamwork. Um, and just the final point is, you know, if you're not already a member of the U.S. Human Rights Network, we invite you to join the movement by becoming a member. Um, and as you hear, um, we do prioritize our dues-paying member for our scholarships that will be available for both the February 20th um, consultation at Howard University and then for the delegation that will be going to Geneva. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank all of our speakers, Rebecca, Tinjiwe, uh, Amy, Mary, Josh, and RJ. Um, we really appreciate all the insight and uh, information being able to provide today. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Yolande. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.